शुक्लांबरधरम विष्णु शशिवर्णम चतुर्भुज प्रसन्न वदनम ध्यानोपात ओम गुरु ब्रह्मा गुरु विष्णु गुरु देव महेश्वर गुरु साक्षात पर ब्रह्म तस्म श्री गुरव नम ओ अखंड मंडलाकार व्या चराचर तत्परम दर्शित तस्म श्री गुरव नम ओ अंतस्तमिलेर बानवे काम धेन वे विकल्प जगती कल्पतर वे गुरव श्री विजयेश्वरी देवी आत्माजलि ओ सर्वंगल मंगल्य शिव सात साधि के शरण्ये त्रयंबके देवी नारायणी नमोस्तुते जय करुणामयी Namaste. My name is Darren, and I'm offering this class on Sanskrit pronunciation for Amma's beloved children who are going to be attending the Lalita Sasrana Mahayagya set to take place in May. Great boon for our earth, and a great opportunity. So, a quick disclaimer: I'm not a Sanskrit acharya. I'm really not qualified to be offering this class, but. Because there's been so much interest in learning this uh, blessed stotram, and uh, I have studied Sanskrit for many years. I've had the blessings of studying uh, briefly with Pandit Rajmani Tuganite of the Himalayan Institute. So I feel, hopefully, I have something to offer. But if there's any mistakes here, please forgive me, and please feel free to contact me and correct me. So uh, with that disclaimer, uh, let's begin. Sanskrit is known as Deva Bhasha, which means the divine language. It's the language of the gods. It's a revealed language, actually. The rishis, in their meditations, were in touch with the fundamental vibrations of the creation. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word created everything. So, Amma has said that our uh, Vag Karmendriya, our power of speech, is different from our organs of action. It's very powerful. Even the rishis created whole worlds before, just from the command of their powerful word. And this universe, likewise, was created by a word. So when we study Deva Bhasha, this divine language, it's really like studying the real periodic table of elements of the universe, of the creation, because these are the subtle vibrations inside of anything. This is why they say even if you don't understand mentally or intellectually what you're chanting with Sanskrit. Vibrationally, you understand it because your soul resonates with it. It's working on your soul, and they also say Sanskrit is not like learning another language. It really is a spiritual practice. It's a sadhana, and so when we learn this uh, this sadhana, we practice it. We actually experience changes within our body, changes in our lives. The seed sounds are very powerful at awaking up the sparks of divinity inside of us. So the first thing an English speaker comes across when they look to the Sanskrit alphabet is how many more letters there are than we have in English. Uh, we only have 26. Sanskrit has uh, these 50 uh, akshas. So there's a lot of subtlety we're going to learn by studying Sanskrit. It's broken down very scientifically, the different resonant chambers of sound in our mouth, how we make those sounds in our mouth. Namely, there are five uh, principal resonant chambers in our mouth. The first is in the back of the throat. The second is in the palate, the soft palate. The third is at the roof of our mouth. The fourth is on the back of our teeth, particularly the top row of the teeth. And then the fifth is at the lips. So when we begin Sanskrit, we have to start with the vowels. The vowels are the shakti and the consonants of the Shiva, right? So there's no manifestation without the Shakti. There's no consonant sounds without the vowels. I can say Ka, but without A, I can't say it. <laughs> so 
Uh, this is why Lalita Devi is praised as Panchapretasana Athena. She's the goddess seated on five corpses. Those are the five lords of the actions of the universe. And even Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, they create, preserve, and destroy the universe. They're like corpses without Shakti. They're unable to do anything, even to move a blade of grass. So likewise, uh, the vowels of the Shakti were unable to pronounce anything in Sanskrit without the vowels. And there's 16 of these little goddesses. And they correspond to the 16 petals of our throat chakra. Because that's where Saraswati, the Vag Shakti, resides, is in Vishuddhi chakra. Rhythm is very important in Sanskrit. It completely determines the meaning of the words, the rhythm that we say them. So there's a big difference between Ananda and Ananda. Right? Ananda means joyless. Ananda, on the other hand, means pure bliss. So that one little extra meter of rhythm in the beginning there, the A ah versus A, uh, it turns joyless into blissness. <laughs> uh, that one little swara makes that big of a difference. When we're first born, the first sound we can make at the back of our throat, when we open our mouths to make sound, is a. Uh, and that's the guttural vowel sound. So in that guttural position at the back of the throat, we open it up and we say a. Uh. Now the next place we can make sound is in the palate. If we move the sound up a little bit, we have e. Now to access the cerebral or the dental, we'll have to involve the tongue. So let's just uh, wait on that. We'll assume as babies we haven't grabbed firm uh, usage of our tongue yet. But we find our lips pretty easily. And so if we use our lips to make a vowel sound, it sounds like oo. So we have a uh in the guttural, e in the palatal, oo uh in the labial. Those are all the short versions. Uh, E, U. Now, if we want to do the long sound, it's very simple. We just open up our mouths a little bit wider. Ah, E, U. And saying them side by side, the first one, the short sound, stays inside the mouth. The long sound comes outside of the mouth. Ah, ah, E, E, U, U. Ah. Ah, e, e, u, u. And so once we learn how to use our tongue, there's two main places our tongue can be placed inside the mouth. And this is a big difference from English because we don't have this distinction. Whenever we say a T or a D sound, it's coming from somewhere in between these third and fourth positions here. And so usually, because the dental sound is a very specific flavor in the sound, usually when Indians hear us speaking, they assume all of our T's and D's are cerebral because it doesn't have that dental quality. If it's not touching the teeth, it's a different sound. So even though we're not really doing a strong retroflex action with our tongue, which is where we curl it backward and point the tongue, tip of the tongue more towards the top of the roof, like in this position. Uh, when we speak English, it's usually a little bit farther forward. So usually uh, an Indian will hear us and assume we're speaking uh, cerebral sounds with our T's and D's. This is why the dental sound is a very fine study. And this is the tongue position for the dental sound. You can see it's right against the back of the top row of teeth. And notice how the tongue is flat. So it's an essential, in order to be able to become adept at moving your tongue from the back of the teeth to the cerebral, the retroflex position, more towards the roof of your mouth, you have to learn how to keep your tongue flat when speaking, which is different from how we usually speak in English. So going back to the vowels then, if I turn my tongue up towards the roof of my mouth to make it a strong retroflex, a distinct retroflex sound, and use it to make a, a vowel sound, it goes rr, rr, rr. Now, you might not be adept at fluttering your tongue there. So that's okay. If you just make that rr sound, you're close enough. Urshi, right? One who sees. Mahershi, 
Right? Automatically, the tongue can tur curl backward if you just train it to uh, make it more like a strong retroflex R sound. R now, if we extend that out and make it long, it goes ri, ri, ri. Now, if I learn how to move my tongue to this dental position, I'll make a l sound if it's if I'm trying to make a vowel. Well, really, you can't do l and have it be a vowel. It's more like a consonant. So to make it more like a vowel where it's carrying the air, we curl it back to the retroflex, striking the dental first. Lurt. 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 If I make that long, lri. 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 Lurt. Ri. Lurt. Lri. Lurt. Ri, lr, lri. So a little warning that when you're chanting Sanskrit, you're probably never going to see the vowels lr and ri. They really just exist kind of like how we know certain elements existed in the periodic table because of the theory behind it, but they don't really occur in nature. So it's similar with these vowel sounds. They don't really occur so much in uh, Sanskrit ch chanting. R and ri we will see, but l and ri uh, they don't really appear. So there's a couple other sounds that we can make, namely if we combine some sounds. So in between guttural and palatal, if we make a uh and e together, well we can't really combine them low in the mouth. We have to kind of strengthen them when we combine them and raise them up higher. And we put a uh and e together, we get a, a. So a uh and e make a. Now, if we strengthen it one more time, we can actually bring the sound up a little bit higher than that, and it sounds like i, i. So those are these two vowel sounds: a, i. Combination of the guttural and the palatal vowel sounds. There's another place we can combine vowel sounds without involving the tongue, which is the guttural and the labial. So that's the entire mouth cavity that's getting involved in the sound. When we put together a uh, and u, we get o, o, and that's the first strengthening of that combination. A uh, and u makes o. Now, of course, everybody knows this, uh, om is not just two sounds. It's not o and m. Mm, it's three sounds because within the o is a and u together. And that's why the Mandukya Upanishad explains very beautifully the sadhana of chanting om has Brahma, Vishnu, and Maheshwara in there. A is the sound of creation, u is the sound of preservation, and m mm is the sound of dissolution. So all three are together in there because a and u together make o. That's the first strengthening. If we strengthen it one more time, we get ow, ow, o, ow. So these compound vowels here, they're all the combination of two swaras together. So in the first set of vowel sounds, we had short and long. Compound vowel sounds are automatically long. It's important to know they automatically get two beats when we chant them, just like a long vowel sound. These last two are kind of special. Uh, they're represented by dots. So here we th have the dot over a. Uh, and this dot over a vowel sound is called anuswara. It literally means after vowels. could also mean the inner sound. It's a special vowel sound uh, that kind of changes form depending on uh, what's following it. But we'll talk more about that later. Right now, it's very simple. We're just going to close the vowel sound off. And that's what Anuswara means, is a closing. Um. Um. If Anuswara appeared after E, it'd be im. If it appeared after U, it'd be um. Simple. The next uh, and last of the vowels is Visarga. These double dots here afterwards. So it's appearing after the A. Uh, 
and it literally means uh, pushing out. So it's a little bit of force at the end of it. We don't just say ah. We put a little force behind the air and it comes aha. Aha. If it was after e, it'd be ihi. And if it was after u, it'd be uhu. But standard Sanskrit uh, alphabet, we put it after ah. Aha. So let's chant all the 16 vowels together. We'll do it one line at a time. Ah, ah, i, i, u, u. Ah, ah, i, i, u, u. R, ri, r, ri. R, ri, r, ri. A I O L M A H A I O L M A H From the beginning all sixteen together A A I I U U R R I L R R I A I O L M A H those are the 16 vowel sounds and the 16 petals of the throat chakra. So coming now to the consonants. So just as you can see, it's a diagram. It's a, a perfect grid of all the sounds we can make in our mouth. Those five special positions we see here uh, make up the horizontal rows of the consonants. And the vertical uh, we'll talk about a little bit more. But first, just look at the basic sound you can make in each position. It's called the hard sound. So before we become more subtle in our pronunciation, the easiest thing is to do is to make a hard sound. In the guttural position of the mouth, if we make a hard consonant sound, it goes ka, ka, ka. In the palatal place, if we come up to that soft palate, we get cha. Now for the cerebral, uh, even if you look at the the Devanagari symbol here for cerebral, it's got that curved uh, shape to it. And it's kind of like to remind us of the curl of our tongue here. So we're curling our tongue uh, up, the tip of the tongue up to the roof of the mouth and making the sound ta. Ta. So this is the one that it's good for us to really uh, exaggerate it as English speakers because normally when we say T the tip of our tongue is above the back of the teeth it's not touching the teeth but it's not really curled back either if we curl it back really strong it, you can hear that retroflex quality the er sound in there da, da. right because the curl the tongue is curled backward it's not fully letting the sound out da. now the dental is something to really pay attention to because this is something we don't do in English normally and you'll find that when you start to really pay attention to this that the mantras take on a very sweet quality to it they say the tip of the tongue is associated with our sense of uh, sweet taste and you can really feel the difference in it if we say ta 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 is very different from our regular English teas ta ta so you can hear the difference if somebody says Saraswati versus Saraswati. Right. The second one is not it doesn't have that sweet quality. Saraswati. Then we come down to the labial and it's very simple. Pa. Pa. So if instead of a hard sound we make a soft sound, then we come over here to the third column. In the guttural position, that soft sound is ga, ga, ga. In the palatal, ja, ja, ja. Cerebral, da, da, da. Dental, da, da. Da and labial. Ba. 
ba ba now let's talk about this concept of an aspirated vowel in Sanskrit the rishis were so concerned about our prana the use of our breath when we speak and actually when you start to study the grammar and the laws of combination all the rules of grammar suddenly make beautiful sense when you realize that it's just to conserve the prana used when speaking so every little rule it's always to conserve the most amount of life force and be the most efficient in conveying what we're speaking so there is an attenuation to the amount of prana being used when spoken and so these aspirated consonants are called mahaprana sounds because there's a lot of prana behind them a lot of breath behind them and these are the ones that Amma says are very important to emphasize when we're chanting mantras in particular because they contain so much power in them and you don't want to miss the power of these very special consonant sounds in the guttural it's just like ka but we're going to put more air behind it and you really want to make it feel like there's air coming out of your mouth when you say it. Ka. 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 It's the difference between ka and ka. If we do the soft aspirated, again we just do ga and add a lot of air. Ga. 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 So that we can chant all the way across the row now, let's talk about the nasal. Nasal is very simple, just what the tongue naturally makes if you hold it there in that position. So in the guttural position, this is the hardest one, it goes nga, nga. It's very easy to think if you just think of ng sound. We say it when we say the word king, for example. King nga. So it's a nga sound. Coming to the palatal, the hard aspirated come from cha to cha, cha. Soft aspirated, ja, ja. Reading across the top, cha, cha, ja, ja. And then the nasal sound and the palatal, we're using the top of the tongue still, not the tip. Nya. Nya. You can feel how that's different from nga. It's farther up in the mouth. Nya. Come into cerebral then. If we put the aspirate to ta, we get ta. Ta. Put the aspirate to da, we get da. Da. And then the nasal na. And it's worth noting here, all the cerebral sounds have this dot underneath it in the English transliteration. So we don't, it'll take a long time to learn the Sanskrit uh, alphabet, the symbols for each letter and to be able to read it. That's a, a much deeper study. Uh, it takes a lot more time than learning the pronunciation. So if we're reading the English, we, this is what we have to pay attention to. If there's a dot underneath any letter, it always means a cerebral sound. And it's worth noting, if you look up at the cerebral vowel sound, r, it also has the dot, as is ri. L r ends in a cerebral sound, and so it also has the dot underneath it, even though it begins in dental. Okay, so the dot underneath means cerebral. If there's no dot, then it's dental. Ta, 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 da, da, da and then the nasal na. Coming to labial, pa, pa, ba, baha, ma, pa, pa, ba, baha, ma, pa, pa, ba, baha, ma. So let's read all the consonants. Uh, we'll go one line at a time. Ka, ka, ga, ga, nga. Ka, ka, ga, ga, nga. And let's do the palatal. Cha, cha, ja, 
जहा या छा छा जा जहा या सरेब्रल टा ठा डा ढहा ना ठा ठा डा ढहा ना डेंटल ठा ठा डा ढहा ना ठा ठा डा ढहा ना Labial. Pa, pa, ba, ba, ma. Pa, pa, ba, ba, ma. Right now we have the semi-vowel sounds. These are kind of in between vowels and consonants, so they're called semi-vowels. Uh, they carry the qualities of both. And it's interesting that these are also the bijakshas for the different chakras, right? La, lam is for muladhara, vam for swadhisthana, ram for manipura, yam for anahata. So, very simple. Ya, ra, la, va. And again, don't stress if you can't flutter your tongue for the ra. You're still totally comprehensible if you say ra. Ya, ra, la, va. Ya, ra, la, va. The sibilants, these are the S sounds that we can make with our tongue. If we make a hissing sound with our tongue in different parts of the mouth. In the palatal place, uh, we can't make a hissing sound in the guttural place, but we can do it in the palatal place. It makes sha. Sh, and this is the typical English sibilant when we say a sh. So most people say Shiva correctly because it's the palatal uh, sibilant, and that's what we're used to in English. Shiva, Shiva, sh. The cerebral sibilant is again with that dot underneath it. So we're going to think I have to curl my tongue backward, bringing the tip of my tongue to the roof of my mouth. Sh, sh. And incidentally, if we say Vishnu, this is a cerebral sibilant. So most of us are saying Vishnu incorrectly because we don't have this in English. But uh, you can hear that uh, cerebral quality if you say it correctly. And then the Na following the Sha is also cerebral. Vishnu. Vishnu. Sha. Then we have the dental sibilant. If we bring our tongue to the back of our teeth, sa, sa. And finally, we have uh, just a sound that's made if we open our mouth and make air, ha, ha. Ya, ra, la, va, sha, sha, sa, ha. So these compound consonants, they're not standard. These are the ones given in the Himalayan tradition. Uh, three extra compound consonant sounds. Y they do get their own symbol universally. These are the symbols for these compound consonants, but they're special. So they're worth covering. If you put ka and a cerebral syllable together, sha together, you get ksha. Ksha. So, ksham is the seed sound of forgiveness. We see that in the beautiful word virksha, which means tree mother. She's the energy of forgiveness, total selflessness, and there's no coincidence why um, virkshasana occurs in Amma's Yoga Asana sequence, because Amma wants us to learn forgiveness as it's a great charity. Ksha. Then, this is a very difficult one if you try to say it in its parts. If you put ja and nya together, both palatal, the soft and nasal sounds together, well, we would try to say jnya, but uh, it ends up wasting a lot of prana. And so how we pronounce it instead is gya, like a G and a Y sound. Gya. 
Gya. So Gyan is knowledge. Jnana Yoga is the path of knowledge. And it contains this compound consonant Gya. Jnana. Finally, if we put Ta and Ra together, the dental hard sound and the semi-vowel Ra, we get Tra. Tra. And of course, we're all familiar with this in the word mantra. So tra means to protect, and it has that strong energy of protection. So mantra means that which protects the manas, the mind. So those are all the letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. Let's chant them all together, starting from the vowels and moving down. A, a, i, i, u, u. R ri r ri A I O Ao Am Aha Kaka Gagaha Nga Cha Cha Ja Jaha Nya Ta Ta Da Daha Na Ta Ta da da ha na pa pa ba ba ha ma yara lava sha sha sa ha sha gya tra. So I have a recording of Pandit Rajmani Tuga night at the Himalayan Institute uh, chanting these vowel sounds for you. He goes through it one time in its entirety and he explains also that in traditional Sanskrit schools they leave out the r ri r ri when they're chanting the full alphabet <coughs> because those are more specialized vowel sounds anyways and so there's in the recording he'll go through the Sanskrit alphabet also a little bit quicker and omitting those in a traditional recitation format. Ah, uh, ah, uh. I, I, U, U, Ri, 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 E, I, O, Ao, Am, Ah, Ka, Ka, Ga, Ga, Na. Cha, cha, ja, ja, nya. Ta, tha, da, dha, na. Ta, tha, da, Dha Na Pa Pa Ba Bha Ma Ya Ra La Wa Sha Sha Sa Ha, Kha, Gya, Tra, A, A, I, I, U, U, E, A, O, A, O, Am, A, Ha, Ka, Kha, Ga, Gha, Nga, Cha, Cha, Ja, Cha, Nya, Ta, Tha, Da, Dha, Na, Ta, Tha, Da, Dha, Na, Pa pa ba ba ma ya ra lava sha sha sa ha cha gya tra a a i i u u e a o ao am a ha ka kha ga gha nga cha cha ja cha nya ta tha da dha na ta tha da dha na Pa pa ba ba ma 
ಯಾರಾಲಾವ ಶಾಶಾಹ ಕ್ಷತ್ರ So now you know the elementals of sound that make up the Akshamala, the Sanskrit alphabet. It's worth saying that if you're reading a Sanskrit verse or hymn that all of the red letters will be the English transliteration. And most hymns that are properly translated will look exactly like this, so there won't be any confusion between the cerebral and dental sounds, for example. If you're reading a version that is made from a typewriter and they didn't have these special characters available like in an email message for example there's a lot of creative ways people have found uh to do that but there actually is an accepted international standard and this is called the i trans or indian language transliteration and this is what the akshamala looks like transliterated using i trans so you'll notice the long vowels are basically doubled or capitalized and any special kind of character is capitalized to symbolize it so the retroflex sounds are all capitalized r ri l r ri ta ta da da na all capitalized also you'll notice visarga the a uh, at the end is capitalized and anuswara uh, you'll sometimes see anuswara with a dot because when we transliterated it uh, with the special character it's the m with the dot underneath it but here you'll see it often as capital m or dot m so this is just worth mentioning you can pause the video and copy that uh or study it and memorize it for your resource now talking about anuswara we wanted to talk a little bit more about this special character it is the inner vowel that changes according to what follows it So if there's nothing that follows it and it's just closing the mouth you make an um sound. But depending on what's following it it could change. So for example, we have these five principal positions in the mouth. If anuswara comes before a guttural sound, then it turns into the ng sound, the nasal in the back of the throat. And that just makes sense, right? Look at the first example there, the conch shell in Sanskrit is called shankha. Now you might see it written with the m and the dot underneath it. Certainly certain Vedic texts assume this working knowledge of the laws of sandhi, the rules of combination, and if anuswara is being combined with a guttural sound it is always pronounced ng, the n with the dot over it. So that's shankha. Now we couldn't study some Sanskrit words without studying some of the divine names of Lalita Devi, given that this is the intent of this study in preparation for that great stotram of praise to the divine mother so i chose a couple of names here name 408 shivankari 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 so she who brings auspiciousness is the very simple translation i'm offering shiva is auspicious and uh, kari is the one who's carrying it the vehicle for it So this is Shivankari the one who brings auspiciousness. Number 50 is Anavadyangi. 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 I won't try to translate these names because it's a huge study. I'm not qualified at all with Amma's grace. Hopefully we'll have some of her holiness's translations of these most powerful names, but I'm sure that each name is going to have several pages behind it. Okay, if anuswara precedes a palatal sound, it's the nya, the palatal nasal sound. So a couple of examples here. Niranjana. 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 Ranjana is color, refers to the way desires color our perception. So Niranjana, she who's uncolored, she's perfectly transparent. Number 948. panchami 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 when she is a fifth is a very basic translation of course the number 5 is very auspicious refers to the five panchamahabhutas of mother nature of course divine mother is in that form and gaya three day because we know has five heads as well so if anuswara precedes a cerebral sound it's pronounced like the cerebral nasal na there's a couple nice 
examples here, number 755, Chandika, Chandika, Chandika. Chandi Devi is the killer of the demon of pride and the demon of shame. She's the goddess praised in the 700 verses to the Divine Mother. She's also the goddess in Mysore. This, the presiding goddess there at the Shakti Pitam in Mysore, the same temple that Amma's mother took a holy pilgrimage to and received the divine darshan and vision that she would give birth to an incarnation of the goddess. The name 392, this is a mouthful. Shri Kantardha Sharirani. Shri Kantardha Sharirani. Shri Kantardha Sharirani. So Sri Kanta is a name for Lord Shiva, the holy throated one who drank the world's poison. And Ardha is half. Sharira is the body. Half of Divine Mother's body is Lord Shiva. They're always together. You can never separate Shiva and Shakti. So if Anuswara precedes a dental sound, it's pronounced like the dental nasal na. All these are very easy to understand, but it's worth practicing a little bit. So 447, beautiful name for Divine Mother, Shantihi, 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 she who is ultimate peace. And then of course, have to explain why Sanskritam was spelled with the M with the dot underneath it and pronounced like a Na, because it's Anuswara, Sanskritam, 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 what we're studying. So if Anuswa precedes a labial, it's very simple. Labial nasal sound is ma. Name 122. Shambhavi. Shambhavi. Name 877. Niralamba. 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 Name 268. Samharani. Samharani. So there are also rules of combination, Sandhi rules for Visarga, the last of our vowel sounds, but we can cover that in future lessons. The next lesson will be about the rhythm in Sanskrit. It's very important we get the good rhythm down. So again, give my contact information here in case you have any questions. Feel free to contact me. Thank you very much. Chant a couple of closing prayers for world peace. Om Asatoma Satgamaya Tamasoma Dyotir Gamaya Mrityorma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu Swasti Jai Karunamai